talking this morning about how hope behaves. I'm kind of on a hope jag, and I think it's a good one. I think that hope is front and center and needs to be front and center. We've talked about it a lot recently. But a few weeks ago, we showed the little video clip, talks about the, the fact that the Bible is a book of hope, and indeed it is. Uh, it is absolutely a book about hope. And we stake our claim upon that hope found in the book. And so our confidence, our surety is in the hope that we find in Scripture. And how important, because the world today so desperately needs the hope that God has blessed us with being able to find. So as individuals who've discovered hope, we are a community of believers, a community of hope. And I think that's true in every sense of the, of the word. Not just a community of, of hope where we talk about it, but where we actively demonstrate it to others. So that when the hopeless come in through these doors and come into our midst, we administer God's hope to them in word and in action. And so we seek to be those who live that hope. And that is so important because we live, as it has been called, in a postmodern, post biblical era. And so people today are very, very skeptical of those who profess a faith in God and in Christ and in the Bible. And so because there is great skepticism out there, people want to know more about how we live than in what it is that we have to say. If we demonstrate that we're living what we say, then they'll pay attention to what we say. So I believe that our study this morning is very, very practical because we look at what John says about how hope behaves. And so as the people who have embraced the great hope that we have, how does it behave in our lives? What does lifestyle look like? So with that said, verses 2 and 3 of 1 John chapter 3. John addresses us as beloved, those who are loved. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as as he is pure. Again, think about that third verse. Everyone who has this hope fixed upon his or her life purifies himself or herself just as he is pure. Last week we looked in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. And there it says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that verse challenged us to make sure that we had a, a fix on the hope that we're going to receive on the day when Christ returns. And so now John tells us that if we have that hope fixed on us, if we've locked into hope, then we live a certain way. We purify our lives even as Jesus Christ is pure himself. So therefore, we are a people with a fixed hope. We need to be a people with a fixed hope. And so in a sense, hope is our GPS signal lock for living. And so as we have our hope fixed and locked in, we live in some very specific ways. I believe there are three great truths out of those two verses that I just read. And that's going to be our fix in the next few moments here this morning. And I want you to think about the implication of each of these three things. Number one, I'll just read them off. And then we're going to look at each one specifically. Number one. Who we are is basis for what we will be. Secondly, what we will be motivates who we are becoming. And then thirdly, what we were is inconsistent with our destiny. I think those are kind of deep things, so we need to think about them a fair bit. So let's go back and think about that very first one. Who we are present tense, is basis for what we will be. John says, now, present tense, we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what it is that we will be. So there is a certainty about the present tense right now in this moment. As believers in Christ, as born-agains, 
right now we are the children of God. And John honestly says it hasn't been completely clarified to us what it is that we're going to be. We're in a process that's not entirely clear. The end result, which we'll talk about in a minute, is absolutely clear. But the transition from who and what we are right now to what we're going to be, that part is perhaps a bit vague. But what we are right now, I need to linger on that thought. Right now we are the children of God. And I think about the phrase children of God, child of God, family of God. We talk about that concept a great deal. And in some ways I lament it because it is easy for us to take for granted who and what we are right now. Have you paused and thought recently about what it means for you to be a child of God? Have you thought about what it means to really be a member of God's family? Let me give you some refresher verses to help you appreciate it perhaps a bit more. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Gave the right. He gave the right, the privilege, the benefit to become children of God. Backing up in the passage we're looking at into verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God and such we are. I know some of you want to break into a little chorus from back in the 70s based on that, right? Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's how we remember it, I guess, because of a song that goes back that far. But take a good look at how great the love that the Father has bestowed on us. He has lavished upon us this love that we would be called the children of God. Again, the right, the privilege, the benefit to be a child of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We talk a lot about Galatians 3.29, the benefits that we receive of Abraham through Christ. The Spirit of God within us bears witness with our spirit, resonates within, I like to think. That Spirit resonates within us that we are the children of God. If you're listening to Holy Spirit in your life, you know and are assured that you are His child and a member of His family. That Spirit is bearing witness moment by moment in our lives. And if we're children, we intend to receive a great inheritance. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. We are children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. We're the brightness of the world. What a dark place the world would be without the children of God. But our very presence in this world brings light to it. And I like to think that the light shines the brightest when the darkness is the greatest. And we're moving into some pretty dark times. And so the darker this age, as we come to the close of this age, the brighter we shine. No matter how many of us there are, we shine brightly against the darkness of this age. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, God says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Great reminders of who we are right now. We are the children of God. We are the family of God in Christ. We belong to a very special, extraordinary family. We enjoy all the rights and the privileges and the benefits through God's Son. We enjoy forgiveness of sins. Top of the list, that's huge. Many people, even those who've been born again, carry around guilt over sin, which is a real tragedy. We've been forgiven because we're members of the family of God through Christ. We are forgiven of sin, and if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All we can do is name it. And because of the blood of Christ, it's gone, so we don't have to carry any of it. So as members of the family of God, we enjoy forgiveness. We have free and ready access to our Father anytime, anywhere. Need be no doubt whatsoever. Wherever you are, whatever your circumstances, you have God's ear. As His child, He's ready to listen. 
And so we enjoy that benefit, privilege, and right. And as we mentioned, we have the hope of inheritance. The best is yet to come. We've got great blessings now, but we ain't seen nothing yet compared to what it is that he has for us in the future age. Does anybody agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, just checking. Want to make sure you're with me on this. That's only one of the things we're talking about. Secondly, according to John, who we are is basis for what we will be. Thinking about the fact that we will one day see Christ as he is, according to what John says. It does not appear during the transitional stage how it is we're going to get there. But nevertheless, there will be a day that when he appears, we will be like him and we will see him as he is. That is an absolutely mind-boggling concept for me. There will be a day that I will be like Christ is now. I will see him as he is, and I will have a striking resemblance to him. We all will. What an amazing concept. So therefore, who we are right now is basis for what we will be. And I'm thinking about how naturally, in a sense, a child has certain genetic qualities that they get from their parents. We all have that. And a child will grow up according to that DNA that they get from their parents. We have the DNA of God in our lives through Christ, if you want to think of it in those terms. And so we, we have that basis for what we're going to grow up to be someday at the return of Christ. And so uh, there ought to be a lifestyle that we live consistent with who we are becoming, which kind of leads into the second point of what we will be motivates who we are becoming. We know that when he appears... We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. The results determine the process. Here's something that we take the end and work backwards. And so we know that that is the ultimate result is to be like Christ and to see him as he is. If we know that is our ultimate destiny, that is the ultimate result, then we work it backwards. And I think this is where it gets very, very practical. If that's where I'm headed to and that's what I'm headed to, then what about the process now? What am I bringing into my life that is consistent with who I'm going to be on that day when Christ comes back? And I like to think of it in simple terms, and it is exactly that. I want to rid myself of those things inconsistent with that, and I want to bring in and incorporate into my lifestyle that which is consistent with where I'm headed to, to become like Jesus Christ. And so, lifestyle becomes a very, very important issue. I want a lifestyle that is participating with where it is that I'm headed. Now, the flip side of the coin, the last thing to note here out of these verses is what we were is inconsistent with our destiny. And so where we were before Christ, there, there's none of that worthy of taking along on the trip to becoming like Christ. Go back to 1 John chapter, or in chapter 3 here, verses 4 to 6. Looking down a little bit further, John says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Jump down a few verses to verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin. Because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Right away there's a need to clarify some things because those verses probably just heaped a huge load of guilt on us. Wait a minute, I sin. And it says that if I'm a child of God, it's inconsistent that I should sin. So wait a minute, maybe I'm not even a child of God. We need to clearly understand what John does and does not say about sin. The phrase practice of sin is very important to bring into it at this point because that's what John is talking about. There is a pretty big difference between the practice of sin and what we will call the incident of sin. We all will have incidents of sin. No matter how hard we try today, there will be incidents of sin in our lives. The, the problem is when our lives become characterized by the practice of sin. And John says, one who is born of God, one who's going to be like Christ when he returns, it is totally inconsistent that that individual be characterized by the practice of sin. So I think we understand we can identify certain sinful behaviors. 
that I would not be characterized as a child of God that blatantly, continuously practices a particular sin. Uh, I can go and have it forgiven, might be the mentality that it doesn't matter what I do, I'm forgiven. It'll be wiped away. I will do it anyway. I become hardened in the practice of sin, even such that others would look at me and, and identify me as such and such regarding the practice of sin. The practice of sin becomes the problem that ought not to characterize us. Doctors and lawyers practice medicine. They practice law. We can bring that to bear in terms of sin. We don't want to be those who are in the practice of sin. John defines sin as lawlessness, total disregard for the law. We're not talking about human laws, the laws of the United States or the state of Arizona, talking about the laws of God. The orderly one who has established certain laws, lawlessness, is totally disregarding not only what he has taught, but who he is. And so it is inconsistent with followers of Christ to be lawless in the sense of disregarding uh, what God has said and what God is. John tells us that Christ appeared to take away sin. And so if that was his purpose was to take away sin and we want to bring it back and make it a practice in our lives, that's inconsistent with the work of Christ and the character of Christ. So again, that past behavior before Christ is, is totally inconsistent with him. So Christ has forgiven us of sin. Again, we will commit incidents of sin, but the practice of sin he has cured us of. And so I like to think that what Christ has done is brought us into the ultimate rehab program. And so he's cured us of the practice. Again, we're going to lapse backward from time to time every single day. But again, the habit of it we are cured of because of what Christ has done. Thinking about this lifestyle that we are called to live. If we anticipate becoming like Christ someday. I'm thinking about something I shared a couple weeks ago with you. A tale of two kingdoms. You remember that? Talked about two very distinct realms. And I, I illustrated that in your outline this morning, summarized it, because I think it's good to be very clear on that. There are two realms to which every human being belongs to or, or can belong to. And, and the more we understand that, the easier it is to move into the lifestyle and the realm where we ought to be. By default, we are born into the system of the world. We come into the world as sinners. We belong to the system of the world. And you take a look at some of the qualities there. And I don't know that we're going to try to look up and read all those verses, but I want to submit them for your study. We were, and I think I listed the word practicers of sin. I got thinking about it. Maybe that's not even such a, a real word. Maybe practitioners. I don't know. Plug in the right word if that's not the right one. But whatever the case, we were in the habit of sin as we talked about. We were practicers of sin. We were also of the devil. Because it is pointed out that he sinned from the beginning. And so in the habit of sin, it's consistent with belonging to our father in a sense of the world. And along with that, we were of the world. A number of verses that can be brought in concerning that. In fact, we ought to pause and take a look at some of those to understand the realm that we used to belong to. Flip over a page to chapter 2. Looking in verses 15 to 17, John has earlier said, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world, if anyone loves the world. The love of the Father is not in him. Two mutually exclusive realms. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world, from that realm. Chapter 3 that we're looking at, verse 13. John says, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Again, mutually exclusive realms. Chapter 5, verse 19, talks about that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So that's one realm. That's where we were. But as those born again who belong to Jesus Christ, who we are and who we are becoming, we are those that practice righteousness. We get into the habit of the kinds of things that please God. We are children of God in Christ, as we said earlier. We are of the Spirit of God, as verses 23 and 24 point out. We are those who practice love. Verse 18 says that we ought to love not with word uh, or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we are not those that talk a good game in terms of love. We are those who actively practice it. We are of the realm of the kingdom of God. Pointing those two things out, those who belong to each realm increasingly become like the father of that realm. If we belong to the realm of the world, the system of the devil, 
we increasingly become like the father of that system, and that is Satan. That's what we don't want. If we belong to the realm of the kingdom of God as children of God, we become increasingly like the father of that realm, our father and creator, and also our Lord Jesus Christ. We become who and whose we are. And that's a principle I think worth lingering on for just a little bit. If we belong to the Father, if we belong to the kingdom of God, we ultimately become like who we are at the core and whose we are. There ought to be a consistency with lifestyle. We ought to live a life that's pleasing to our Father. A sobering reality check. Someone said along those lines that polls consistently indicate that there is virtually no difference in America between those who claim to be born-again Christians and the population at large when it comes to sexual morality, materialism, hedonism, and worldview. Those claiming to be Christians think and act just as the world does. We may claim to believe in Jesus and the Bible, but our lives don't back up the claims. I read that and I thought, wow, I gotta disagree with that. That can't be true. And I wanted to think about us as a body of believers. Well, that, we're the exception rather than the rule. That can't be the case. But I thought, maybe we need to pause and think about it just a little bit. Is there a real difference? There ought to be a real difference. And so while we want, might want to dismiss and say, okay, we are different, that that writer's wrong, and I hope that he is, but it's worth thinking about, is my lifestyle that different from that of the world? It's easy to talk a good game, but do we really live a significantly different lifestyle? I got thinking about the motivation to live the kind of lifestyle that we ought to. I believe that the incentive is not what's the least I can do that pleases God, but how can I most abundantly seek to please Him in every way in my life? Because I think it's rather self-defeating if I have a minimum standard. What will just barely get me in the door of the kingdom, so to speak? If I even think that way and rationalize that way, I am in a lot of trouble. But instead, how do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? How do I overflow with a lifestyle that absolutely pleases Him? If I don't love Him to that degree, I'm in trouble from the get-go. And so living the kind of life that's pleasing starts with, I love Him more than anything else, not just in word, but I want to display that in how I live my life to please Him in every way that I can. And so that becomes the starting point, the mentality to live the kind of life that pleases God. I think sometimes we may not clearly figure out the fundamentals of what does that look like? And I wanted to just conclude this morning by sharing with you a good summary that I found recently. I think this is about as practical as it gets. I think this is an excellent summary of the lifestyle that characterizes those who want to please God and His Son. Let me walk through these here as we wrap up this morning. First of all, and we point this up quite often, read the Bible daily or at least read it regularly. Be in the habit of Bible reading and Bible study. Secondly, pray daily. One writer says, talk with God often. Talk over your problems with God and Jesus. Thank Him and them for who He is, for who God is, and what God has done for you. Confess your sins and admit your weaknesses. Ask God to help show you how to live a life that pleases Him. You know, we have not because we ask not. We ought to ask Him to direct us to lead a life that pleases Him. Pray for others that they may too choose to follow Him through Jesus Christ as their Savior and give Him the leadership of their lives. Depend on the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will teach us, guide us, strengthen us in times of need. Here's one that's kind of preaching to the choir, but attend church regularly. Well, of course, you're here. But this writer says, when you become a Christian, you begin, uh, you begin an authentic personal relationship with Jesus. However, it is important to also have authentic connections with other Christians. In a fireplace, many logs burn together, creating heat and warmth. But a log by itself quickly dies out. Likewise, we too need the fellowship of other believers to keep our faith vibrant and growing. The church is a place where we can worship God and make Him the focus of our lives. And this writer says, I would also add, there's a deliberate one-on-one -on -one connection with someone, a small group experience. That is also vital. And that is church as well. Be of service to others. The more you give yourself in service to others, the more you will enjoy your Christian life. Conquer your doubts. 
Again, a writer says, at times you may doubt that you really are a Christian. Perhaps you failed or surrendered repeatedly to a temptation. Remember, you are not saved because of how good of a person you are, but by putting your trust in what Christ has already done for you. Trust the truth found in God's word over your own subjective feelings. 1 John 5, 13, I write this to you who believe in the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. And another one, I often hear my wife say this one a great deal, live one day at a time. Too often we become anxious about what might happen tomorrow. The Bible promises that God will meet our needs if only we will seek Him, seek first His righteousness, and God's grace will be sufficient to meet the challenges that each new day brings. Learn how to deal with temptation. Temptation is a part of life. It was an issue before you became a Christian. It still will be. You do not, however, have to yield to temptation to sin. The Bible says God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. Be prepared to take advantage of God's way out of temptation, whether it means that you flee the scene of temptation or that you stay on the scene and resist it. And finally, tell others about Christ. Sharing with others about your life in Jesus by word or by action can be one of the most satisfying and ex exciting experiences you have ever had. The Bible encourages us always to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for you to give a reason of the hope that you have. Again, we become who and whose we are. And so we are those who are children of God. We belong to God through Christ. It is consistent that we have a lifestyle that grows such that one day when we see Christ and we are like him, we are in the process even today of becoming that. I'm excited about that and it's good to share this with you this morning.